Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome. Um, let me just jump right in. Uh, interesting markets often. I mean, they're always interesting, right? This is why we play this game. Um, interesting markets. Uh, at this juncture, uh, Eric referenced that things are volatile, things are confusing. They absolutely are. To try and distill it down into si the simplest terms, I basically see that there's two potentials for what can happen from here. And so that's what I'm going to talk about today. And what are those, what are those two potential paths and why I think both of them work well for gold. Um, before I can talk about where we're going, let's talk about where we are. Uh, I don't, it's no, it's not news to anyone that the broad markets have been volatile, had a huge correction before the end of 2018, ended 2018 down for the first time in a really long time. Um, these things really matter. In 2018, uh, stock markets, if you go from the peak, the, the US market peak in January down to the trough in December, lost $20 trillion in equity value. That's a really big number. Yes, markets move up and down, and you know, billions, trillions happen, but $20 trillion in a fairly sustained slide is a significant move, and it stings, and it stays with investors. And that matters because Really, the difference here is that the days of just throwing a dart towards the S&P, buying something and sitting back and watching it gain, those days are over. And so people, investors, are thinking a lot more. They're looking a lot more at what we should buy, why we should buy, and what's happening more broadly. <clears throat> the FANG stocks are a good example of why that's happening. The bull market that we've that in, the, in the broad stocks that we've been experiencing for the last eight, nine years, the FANG stocks were absolute leaders in that set up and they're down 20% in the last six months. 20% is a really big number. So if investors are having to think, if investors are having to look around, that leads them to look for value for the first time in a long time and to question whether there is certainty out there. The three charts up there are the S&P and the FANG, which are um, obvious. The one in the middle is the fear and greed index. Yes, it's up and down and up and down. Is there any pattern there? Eh, you could say that there is, you could say that there isn't. But I would say that in 2018, those two down points and the lows there indicate fear as opposed to greed, which are the high points are more sustained than they have been for quite a while. People are worried, volatility is real, and so I think the way that they approach, the investors approach investing is changing. One of the key reasons that it's changing is because growth is legitimately slowing down. This is not might be, this is not um, pessimism, this is legitimate. Growth is slowing around the world, and it's largely because of tariffs, because of uncertainty about what tariffs might be, and because of things like Brexit. So there's lots of data points that I could use, but I put this chart up because it's a good capture of the big picture. This is manufacturing. These are PMI prints, right? So capturing manufacturing strength. Those are a bunch of different parts of the world, and the trend is pretty clear. They are coming down, and they're coming down because of uncertainty. I have a few more points to add on that later, but growth is slowing. That really matters. That's the current situation. It would be an error to talk about the current situation without looking at rates because that is an area where things have changed a huge amount in a very short period of time. In 2018, the Federal Reserve raised interest rates four times, as I'm sure we all know. That was the first year, 2018 was the first year that they followed through fully on what they said they were going to do. And they boosted rates and they boosted rates and they did it four times and they came through on their plan. Just a few months ago, there wasn't a lot of reason, there wasn't a lot of tangible reason at least, to think that 2019 would be any different. And then the stock market crashed. And now things are really different. The chart here shows rate expectations for the end of 2019. 77% of the market thinks that rates are going to be exactly where they are right now. The market is essentially saying that rate hikes are over. That's a really significant departure from just a few months ago. Of course, it comes from, Col from I always want to say Colin Powell, who is not the Federal Reserve Chairman. Anyway, <laughs> Jerome Powell, who's the guy I'm talking about, has softened his stance quite significantly. He's even talked about reducing the balance sheet um, roll-off, which he had previously said was just on autopilot. Things have changed significantly on the central bank front, on the rate front. That really matters for gold, and it matters generally because the only reason those things step back is because of uncertainty, is because growth is slowing. So these things obviously all tie together. One of the results of all of these current situations is that gold is getting attention. That's a really nice chart. That's the one year, one, year, one month chart for gold. Very nice chart, especially when you compare it to, to 
uh, <clears throat> to other charts. And the reasons that it's happening is because gold is getting buying for its classic safe haven reasons. It's getting buying because of concerns about growth. It's getting buying because the stock market is uncertain, volatile, and, and weak at times. Real rates haven't gone lower yet, but the fact that no one expects them to go higher is a significant departure. And people will theref are therefore forecasting that they're going to go lower. Real, lower real rates is the primary driver for the gold price. The US dollar mostly sideways, but obviously for it to stop ascending, also a strength for gold. So these are classic safe haven reasons for gold buying. What I think is quite interesting though is that the reasons why people are buying gold have actually changed quite a bit in the last six months. Six months. Scotiabank put together this chart and I think it's quite an interesting one. So it's looking at what is best correlated with gold, most strongly correlated with gold, six months ago, one month ago, and today. If you go six months ago, gold was strongly correlated with commodities. And that makes sense when the market is comfortable. When the market is expecting that growth is going to continue, then, then they were thinking, we're sitting here in the late stages of an economic expansion. That means we're setting up for a classic late stage uh, commodities rush. Commodities outperform in the late stages of an economic expansion. This is what's happening. And gold gets, gold is part of that. So gold was being bought alongside commodities. That's what, that was its strongest correlation. Today that has changed completely. Gold is almost not correlated with commodities anymore, and instead, it is correlated with the things that it had very little connection to only six months ago, which are <clears throat> the US dollar, inverse of course, the yen, classic safe haven, volatility, and short-term real rates. So there's been a clear shift. Gold, is now, gold was being bought as a commodity because people were confident about growth and expecting a commodities rally at the late stages of an economic expansion. Now they're worried about the outlook, and so they're buying it as a safe haven. So that's pretty interesting. One, it's proof that gold gets bought in both of those situations, which is nice. And two, which of those is the real setup? Well, that's the question, and really it comes down, I think, in the near term to what happens with the thing that has been dragging, the mar dragging growth down, which is the trade war, right? Because of tariffs and because of uncertainty about tariffs, growth is slowing. Once there is certainty about what will happen there, then the market will know which of these two paths we're gonna go down next. So either there's a deal, in which case fear eases off, confidence returns, growth returns, and the markets rise, at least for a time. Nothing lasts forever, no party goes on forever, it's not gonna be that long, but that would happen. Or there is no deal in which case the slide that we're already started on is the situation that we're gonna stay in and things get bad quite quickly. So for metals investors, the key differential is that in the first scenario, base metals still get their chance. In the second scenario, they don't really get their chance, which sucks because the fundamentals are awesome, but it doesn't matter if the fundamentals are awesome if everything else is falling apart. So those are the, that's the big difference in terms of base, base metals with the two paths. Gold does pretty well either way. So let me look at each of those situations in a little bit more detail. So a deal, a trade deal, and of course the timeline for this is the end of March, so this isn't a long time away. A deal would immediately restore certainty. If you're a business, you are postponing plans. You're postponing buying and selling probably because nobody makes big moves when you don't know what it's gonna cost you. And that's what uncertainty over tariffs is really causing right now. Lack of certainty. Nobody likes to make business plans when they don't know what the deal is. So lack of certainty is what's causing the slowdown in growth. So we would get that turned around. And then replacing fear with confidence. Confidence is the key thing that's been lacking in the markets of late. And so replacing that fear with confidence would help. And base metals are certainly the area that needs this the most, at least the metals area for those of us in this audience. They are the, they are the sector that needs this the most. Throughout 2018, copper and zinc traded completely on fear, not on fundamentals, right? The fundamentals for both metals are very strong. The supply gap is very real. It's not that far out. Growth has to derail really dramatically for those supply gaps to not exist but no one cared at all 
Instead, the prices for both slid and equities performed even worse, leveraging the price slide to the downside because it was all about fear. And fair enough, if there's no deal, if things continue on this downward trajectory, that's the way that base metals are going to go. In that year of fear, things only got better fundamentally for, for example, copper. I know there's a lot going on on this chart, but the second panel, this is a Canaccord chart, the second panel shows uh, global copper stockpiles. It's a 10-year chart, so that whole nosedive at the end is 2018, so that's copper in inventories falling by half last year. It's a dramatic move. And then the third panel there shows uh, capital spending by miners. It was stagnant in 2016, it increased nicely in 2017, and then in 2018 it flattened and started to go down again because the world's big base metal miners weren't, are too scared to spend a lot of money on new projects. That only increases the supply gap that's coming, right? So the fundamentals make a lot of sense. They only got worse during the year of fear, but it doesn't matter. Fear is what was driving the markets, and um, <coughs> we need that fear to be alleviated if we want base metals to have a chance. In the case of a deal, what I would expect to see is that markets would return to the classic uh, trajectory, which means that they would get a classic late economic expansion rally. Some, maybe, maybe it's as much as a euphoric blowout. People see that phrase all the time. Do remember that that isn't going to go on forever. A recession or a bear market in stocks is coming. And so the combination of those two factors would be really pretty darn good for those of us in this room because the late stage uh, rally would be good for base metals. It would give those strong fundamentals in copper and zinc a chance to actually perform. But at the same time, all those investors who have memories and know that parties don't last forever would use that late stage expansion to exit their stocks and buy safe havens. Probably, and that would certainly include gold. And so both sides of the metals market would get an opportunity in the case of a deal. Then there's the option of not having a deal. Now, I, I think this is quite unlikely. China and the United States are very incentivized to come to terms on this. Um, so I think the odds of this are quite low, but it's still important to consider what would happen if rhetoric ramps back up and then things fall apart instead of coming together. Um, and if that's the case, things are gonna not do well the, overall. So I think it's nice to remember, we all know that gold outperforms when the stock market goes to poop and when you know recessions happen. But let's remember, let's look at the numbers to remember just how well, um, how well gold does. So um, John Hathaway of Tocqueville Asset Management put this chart together, which, uh, which nicely shows that since the 1987 crash, there have been 11 sustained market slides. During that time, the S&P lost almost 20% on average, and gold gained almost 7%. It's a big difference, especially when you consider that gold equities would leverage that upside, right? So that's nice. If you narrow your focus and only look at official recessions, there have been six since the 1970s. During those official recessions, gold gained more than 20% on average. Again, gold equities would leverage that to the upside. So gold does really well if things lose it. In the, if, if this is what we come up, come up against, if there is no deal and things uh, turn down, yes, the baby would get thrown out with the bathwater initially. We saw that clearly in 2009. But what we also saw in 2009 is that gold equities detached from the rest of the market pretty darn quickly and started heading back up, leveraging the, le the yellow metal to the upside, right? So <clears throat> in the case of a downturn, I would counsel holding on to what you own. Don't stress about it losing some ground in the, in the short term. Buying more if you're interested, if, if that's depending on your, your particular setup. But don't stress if things go down initially because that's what always happens in a downturn. Uh, and remember that the detached, that gold equities will detach and head up again in not too long. I think I, I just wanted to revisit or, or spend a little bit more time on why am I so certain that things will do so badly in the case of no deal? And this, these quotes, I know this is a lot of words to put on one slide. I try hard to not put so many words on slides. But 
I wanted to put these up here because I think they capture quite nicely the real impact that the trade war is having on growth. So the Institute of Supply Management, which calculates that PMI, which captures manufacturing strength, as they gather data to capture, to, to feed the PMI calculation, they also do a survey. And then they publish the results of that survey in a report that goes along with the PMI print. These, this sort of is what was in the most recent survey. The US numbers came in well below um, forecast. The forecast was for sort of high 57s. Anything above 50 is growth, below 50 is contraction. So it was high 57s, it came in at 54, which is a big gap, still growing, but well down from expectations. And then these are the comments that they got when they were surveying their inputs. And you can see growth is stopped. People are resourcing because of tariffs. Uh, Brexit is a problem. There's concerns about the economy and tariffs. It's having a real impact. This isn't a nebulous thing. This isn't a, oh, things will get bad if. This is really happening. And that's why I have so much confidence that in the case of no trade deal, things will fall apart quickly. Those are the sort of near term, uh, very tangible aspects of the situation. There's another whole series of factors that you could consider if you want to take a, a step farther back. And I really like this quote at the top, which is uh, from Patrick Watson, who was actually summarizing something that he'd read somewhere else. So this is like third hand. But anyways, <laughs> I thought it really uh, captured a, an idea nicely, which is world leaders are so consumed with daily crises that arise in a leaderless world that they're letting a broad array of future risks germinate. And that's really true, right? There are, and, and, and fair enough to a certain extent, because the current crises are really big, like Brexit and a lame duck government that can't even function, and you know, major changes to the degree of socialism in Mexico, and there's lots of very big picture, but immediate crises, if you want to call them that, that are happening right now and that are absorbing everyone's attention. But the need to focus on those means that there's big picture stuff that's just sort of bubbling away and has the potential to make the next downturn a really bad one. So this chart, there's lots of things that I could use as, an, as examples of that, under, that bubbling undercurrent that's, being, uh, that's not getting enough attention, but this chart is just the one that I chose. This is the bid to cover ratio for two year US treasuries. So it's the appetite for, for short term US debt and it's going down. But the thing is, if investors don't think that rates are going any higher, which they don't, remember 77% of people think that, it's gonna, that rates are, rate hikes are over. If rates aren't going any higher, then investors should want short term US debt because this is as good as it's gonna get for this kind of safe haven, but instead they're buying less of it. So there's all kinds of reasons that, are, that could be feeding that. Big picture wise, Deutsche Bank, who put together this chart, suggested maybe there's just too many treasuries out there. And that just taps into the whole concept of US debt and how much there is and how interest rates impacted and whether the government has enough money. All of that, which is a huge conversation on its own, of course, is, is, is the US part of these germinating undercurrents that have the potential to make what could be bad really bad. Okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on that. Hopefully, and I think likely, we get the first situation, which is we do get a trade deal, and therefore we have an opportunity in the near term to, for base metals to act a little bit on their strong fundamentals, for gold to at least be sideways strong, if not better, because people are preparing for the end, which is not too far off. So what should we do? Um, it's worth noting that if news starts to come down that we're not going to get a trade deal, I personally am going to be pretty hesitant on holding any base metal positions because I don't think that they're going to do well. I think the prices of the metals themselves might remain about where they are because the fundamentals are so strong, but equities will struggle to find buyers if the markets as a whole are going down. Again, I don't think that's the likely scenario. But whether we get a deal or not, gold is going to do well. So then it's just a matter of taking a look at your portfolio and making sure that you're covering your bases. You have a, uh, your, your, your bets are spread around the gold sector. These aren't new ideas. If you're looking to, in the mid to large producer side of things, make sure you look for low costs and I would say 
for funded near-term production growth. Not production growth five years from now, the market doesn't care about that, the market wants to see producers that are producing more in the near term. The second two categories there are categories that I think the market hasn't given that much credit to so far in this gold market, which is new and single asset producers. There are some that have gotten good love. I'd say like Atlantic Gold, who's up on stage here with me, is, a, is one that has gotten a good amount of love, but there's lots of other new or single asset producers that haven't gotten a lot of attention yet, but that will when gold starts to really shine. And then projects, I didn't know exactly how to say this, but both strong and splashy. So those are projects where you have a nice solid resource base and it's growing. But at the same time as it's growing and maybe you're wrapping economics around it and you're showing that it's viable, you also have the potential for exciting exploration results. That's the kind of asset, that's the kind of company that I think is going to really stand out in this coming gold market. Um, so those are two categories that I would pay attention to. Always top tier explorers. They're the hardest to pick, right? So that's why make sure you spread your bets. It's easier to pick in the first three categories. It's hard to get it right in the last category. So spread your bets to make sure that you have enough exposure to the gold market that is coming. And uh, I'm out of time. These are my products. I'm certainly happy to talk to you about them more uh, if you're interested. But I will now hand things over to George. <laughs>